I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. The following are selected short stories and quotations from various sources. Some have been either handed down or provided without any firm references. In both cases, we have no way to confirm or verify the information. As such, these stories are provided more for entertainment than factual findings. Others are, or appear to be, highly credible, and we have no reason to doubt the source. Whatever the case, they all serve to provide further insights into the Bigfoot phenomenon. The Chuckanut Mountains, 1470. Whatcom County, Washington. Indian accounts of early Spanish explorers in the area claim that Bigfoot is the descendant of huge, bearskin-wearing, stick-toting slaves called stick people, who were used by Cortez to move the personal treasures of Axaquatl, Aztec ruler of the 1470s, and Montezuma, to a hideaway in the Chuckanuck Mountains outside of Bellingham, Washington, 450 years ago. The legend goes that the stick people's descendants still guard the treasure, awaiting the return of their god Cortez. High in the Chuckanuck Mountains are images of reclining women carved in relief in the rock, apparently marking the front of a Spanish fort. Sasquatch Remains, 1833 Have Sasquatch remains ever been found? Probably several. Have they been recognized for what they are? Almost certainly not. One such account comes from page 151 of Dr. Carl Shucker's book, The Unexplained. In the year of 1833, a 12-foot-tall skeleton was uncovered at Lompoc Rancho, California, by soldiers digging a pit for a powder magazine. The skull had a double row of teeth. Also found were stone axes, carved shells, and porphyry blocks bearing symbols. The skeleton was reburied and lost when the locals started venerating it. Monkey-like wild man, 1904. In 1904, residents of an entire Indian village at Bishop's Cove, Vancouver Island, B.C., abandoned their homes in a state of complete terror. Terror because a monkey-like wild man took to spending nights howling on the beach in an unearthly fashion. The creature, which came out onto the beach at night to dig clams and howl, stood about five feet tall and was covered with long hair. When the steamship Capilano pulled into Bishop's Cove, the village inhabitants put off from the shore in canoes and clambered on board the ship in a panic. The Indians said they had tried to shoot the creature, but failed, which added to their superstitious fears. Two Hunters Murdered, 1927 A report on file from 1927 tells of two hunters from the Quinault, Washington area who were found dead. Their rifles twisted and distorted and all their bones crushed and broken, as though they had been repeatedly smashed against the ground. Followed by a Bigfoot, 1957. In 1957, Charlotte S. lived near Mallet, Washington, southwest of Omak. She walked one and a half miles home from school, weather permitting, along the paved Highway 97. There was a bus that she rode in the morning, but she liked the walk home. For a month in May, she noticed several times that something was following her, she could hear the gravel crunching on the bank above her. When she would arrive home, her Collie Lab mixed dog would be straining on its harness to get loose to get at the something. One day she finally saw it. Charlotte was at home the day it came out of the woods to finally show itself. It stood only 50 feet away, with the sun at its back. It was about 7 feet tall, dark colored, its head was flat on the top, there were tufts of hair on the side of the face, and it had tiny ears. It was apparently attracted to the barn where there were goats and rabbits that had been disturbed at other times. The dog spotted him and wanted to get loose, and the creature knew what I said when I swore at him, she said. Charlotte was 15 years old and not afraid of anything, so she stood her ground and did not retreat. The creature did, and ran back into the brush. Knock on the Door, 1959 a story printed in the Humboldt Times of Northern California stated the following. At 1 a.m. on a moonlit early fall night in 1959, Lawrence Omeg heard a knock on the door of his shack. When he opened the door, a tall Bigfoot was standing there, just standing there looking at him. 
Not knowing what else to do, Lawrence handed the creature a candy bar and closed the door. Uncle Wendell's Encounter, 1963 Ralph Munson has an old tale concerning his Uncle Wendell, who was driving a truck for the Bend Portland Line in 1963. He was driving a blunt-nosed cab-over truck on the east slope of Mount Hood, about 15 to 25 miles east of the crest, and headed east. In the evening, it was not quite dark yet, he stopped when something jumped out from the woods and into the middle of the road. A deer, he thought at first. Wendell said that he did not drink, and that an animal that looked like a gorilla, or more like an orangutan, came up to the truck and first looked through the front window, and then through the side window. Then it grabbed the cab of the truck and started to shake it. Wendell honked the horn and flashed the lights, and the thing ran away up a sheer bank that was very brushy. Rampaging Bigfoot, 1965 An anonymous lady said many years ago, as a girl, that a Bigfoot chased her and her companions down a hill at Raven's Roost in Chinook Pass, Washington. In the same area in 1965, some kids were having a high school party, and one of them shot at a Bigfoot in the dark. The Bigfoot apparently objected and tore the boy apart. He was later found in a pool of his own blood, his ribcage crushed. Soldier Spots Bigfoot, 1967 Fort Lewis, Washington At dawn in the summer of 1967, a soldier was on patrol duty at the time and the sun had just barely come up. Suddenly, a hundred yards off, a dark brownish hunchbacked Bigfoot walked past the compound entrance on the dirt road, just minding its own business. Truck Driver Scare, 1968 a Colville, Washington Indian male, a 50-year-old big rig truck driver, reported an incident that occurred in 1968, in the early morning while he was taking a load of water, filling a large tank on his truck from a stream. A pump was set up in the stream, and while the tank was filling, he relaxed behind the steering wheel in the cab of the truck. There was suddenly a knock on the passenger side window, and a huge Sasquatch face was pressed against the glass. Its nose was flattened against the window, its hair appeared white. Considering the height from ground to window, it would have had to have been about eight feet tall, or more, if stooping or bent over. The driver immediately started the engine and accelerated at the highest rate of speed possible, breaking the attached water hoses as he departed the area. This same fellow reports that on another occasion he saw a Sasquatch on a hillside quite a distance away. He's positive that it was not a bear or other animal because of its bipedal locomotion and upright posture. Bigfoot Steals Deer, 1969 Meat Eaters They Appear to Be was the headline printed in a Skamania, Washington newspaper in 1969, followed by this story. There were two good old boys that had been out poaching this spring. They shot a deer up behind the old town of North Bonneville, or one of them had, and he went down to the local tavern and got his buddy to help him get the deer out. Arriving back at the scene, they found a Sasquatch with this deer. These guys were kind of rounders, characters, but they were very honest people, and I know their story was true. They saw this Bigfoot with the deer over its shoulder, and they both had rifles, but they took one look at what they called a great big ape, changed their minds, and took off. They got maybe a half mile away, and one of them said, Peter, we've got rifles. Let's go back there and get our deer. Well, they got back there all right, and found a lot of pieces of bone and meat scattered around, and quite a bit of blood. They looked at each other and decided to just go back down to the tavern and call it a night. Brender's Pig Farm, 1970s Brender's Pig Farm on Icicle Creek Road, four miles south of Leavenworth, Washington. Ten young fellows in the early 1970s were drinking on a Friday night at the farm. They had some heavy weapons handy. One had a Weatherby elephant gun. At 1.30 a.m., they heard a big noise in the barnyard, Thinking it was a bear, they had a competition to get to the door and shoot the bear, which was probably going after the pigs. Instead of a bear, they found a huge thing with a 150-pound pig in its mouth, biting the neck. All started firing guns, and there were terrible sounds. One fellow knew he hit the seven-foot-tall, wide-shouldered thing at 75 feet, and it was screaming bloody murder. It then dropped the pig from its mouth and began to drag its body away, 
all the while with the ten guys shooting at it. The next morning, they followed the blood trail on horseback for 15 miles before losing it. Canadian Soldiers Run Into Bigfoot, 1970 Before his second tour in Vietnam, soldier Steve Bray was commissioned to Canada. I cross-trained with Canadian soldiers in a special mission. While there, I was told by one of the Canadian soldiers of an incident where his platoon literally ran into a Bigfoot up there in the wilderness. Several soldiers were knocked to the ground with the creature standing over them before it ran away. Steve went on to tell of another interesting incident while on his second tour of duty in Vietnam, 1971-1972. Some G-75 Rangers, 14 of them, were on commission in the mountain ranges above Khe Sanh when the man at point, head of line, shot at a tall, furry, two-legged animal standing upright. Then a band of strange animals came out of nowhere and attacked the 14 soldiers. They had broken arms and limbs and looked like they had been beaten to a pulp. You can probably look this incident up in military archives, as some of these men were hurt so bad they had to leave military service. The animals were called Nui Rung, which in Vietnamese means jungle man. Four Hunters Killed, 1970s An Oregon State Police Officer in Deschutes County, Bend, Oregon, was interviewed on his investigations. The bodies of the men were found busted and broken, and their rifles had been severely twisted out of shape by something with incredible strength. Terrified Campers, 1970s Summertime in the late 1970s, 50 miles west of Aberdeen, Washington, on the north shore of Lake Quinault in Grays Harbor County. A group of campers saw a Sasquatch near their camp at July Creek. One of the men had a 22 caliber rifle. Frightened, he shot at the creature. The man didn't aim at or hit the Sasquatch. He just wanted to scare it away, which he did. The campers were shocked at seeing the creature, but figured they were safe as it was now long gone. Later that night, four Sasquatch showed up at the campsite and began throwing rocks and wood and charging at the campers. The man with the gun fired at them, but only made matters worse. The Sasquatch continued throwing things and then proceeded to beat the fenders off their truck. The terrified campers built fires all around the campsite and burned everything they could to keep the creatures away from them, all their firewood as well as all their camping gear to keep the fires going. They fought the creatures all night long. Just before daylight, they made it to the truck and tried to get away, but the creatures kept them from leaving by picking up the truck and almost rolling it over. When dawn broke, just enough to see, the creatures stopped the harassment and departed back into the woods. With what was left of the damaged truck, the campers escaped and headed straight to the ranger station where they called the sheriff's department to report the incident. Snooping Bigfoot 1970s. In the early 1970s, a Miss Grant lived next to a police officer in Sweet Home, Oregon. She said he came over one day very shaken. He had responded to an early evening incident from Man's Ridge. People from California were moving into a new house on the ridge and had heard noises coming from the garage. Going out to investigate, the family found a huge, tall, hairy creature stooped over looking at stuff in boxes. It immediately left stepped over a barbed wire fence and loped off. The creature was described as foul-smelling and of a really dark color. Silver and black hairs from the fence were analyzed by the Oregon State University and said to be of no known species. The police had been ordered to keep quiet to avoid a panic. The Californians never moved into the house. Steer Stolen from Barn, 1970s In the 1970s, a report from Forks, Washington, during an unusually heavy snowfall, told of a lady hearing a loud commotion in her barn. Investigating, she found the door open and a Bigfoot, who, while totally ignoring her, was carrying out a 300-pound steer. Apparently, researchers John Green and Renee DeHinden were notified and tracked the creatures back into the hills. Rescue on Mount St. Helens, 1970s in the 1970s, two people had become stranded in a glacial crevice on Mount St. Helens. Four expert rescuers were sent to search for them. The rescuers were climbing the glacial ridge, and on the opposite glacial ridge, 
a Bigfoot was climbing parallel to them. It looked toward them, then descended into a vertical crevice in the glacier and was not seen again. The rescuers would have liked to have gone after the creature, but had to rescue the two trapped climbers. All four of the rescuers saw the creature. Boxcar Bigfoot, 1973 In 1973, there was a big lumber company near Deep Lake, Washington, Stevens County, that made cedar shakes. An open railroad boxcar was on the side waiting to be loaded with shingles, when one of the lumber employees noticed a Bigfoot inside. It was just looking around with its back to the door. The employee snuck up, closed the door, and ran to get help. Of course, when he returned, the heavy plywood door was smashed to pieces, and the trapped critter was long gone. Huge footprints were found in the area. Night Raider, 1975 In the fall of 1975, a Bigfoot was sighted frequently raiding the garbage dump on the Indian Reservation at the mouth of the Nooksack River in Whatcom County, Washington. Furthermore, one rainy night, loud screams and loud pounding on picnic tables was heard coming from a nearby campground along the river. Not long after that same night, the river flooded, In 1996, in that same area along the Nooksack River, a Bigfoot had turned two mobile homes over. Nobody was hurt, and they were puzzled about the cause of the attack. This area has produced many Bigfoot reports. Truck Driver Hits Bigfoot, 1977 At the end of January 1977, Doug McClure was crossing Sadus Pass, Highway 97, 10 miles northeast of Goldendale, Washington, near three creeks on the north slope. It was three in the morning and there was snow on the ground as it had been snowing a little earlier. Doug was driving a tractor trailer rig when he saw a Bigfoot next to the road. When it moved onto the road, he was unable to stop and hit it hard. It damaged the tractor, pushing the bumper all the way to the front wheel. The Bigfoot was not apparently badly hurt or frightened. It stood up, looked McClure in the eye, through the front window of his truck cab, and then ran away on two legs. Boy Scout Scare, 1978 Thad Bird of Seattle recalls an incident in 1978 when he was 11 years old. He was in the Boy Scouts, and his group had gone to the mines of Monte Cristo near Index, Washington, Highway 2, east of Monroe. He had wandered off while his companions were having a snowball fight. It was springtime, and during the thaw there was still some snow on the ground. At one point, he looked up to see a big, hairy creature staring at him. It threw its arms in the air and started a high-pitched screaming. Thad ran for the car and locked the doors behind him. He said it had brown shaggy hair, not thick like the Patterson creature, no hair around its face, and its arms were longer. It was seen from about 50 feet away. Bigfoot at the Ballpark, 1979 In the town of Yakult, Oregon, Clark County, the baseball field was the site of three Bigfoot reports. In 1979, a reddish-brown Bigfoot actually came from the nearby forest and stepped out onto the playing field briefly while a game was in progress. Everyone in the visitors' viewing stands saw it. The sun was shining on its hair, it was a clear sunny day, and the chestnut hair was reflecting richly. Later, another sighting was made near the concession stand where several people saw it. The third incident, one man had apparently again seen it from across the clearing. The incidents were unexplained, except that Bigfoot must be very curious. However, there was a rendering plant nearby that also butchered and cut meat, and this could have initially attracted the Bigfoot. Man Sees Dead Bigfoot, 1980 The witness who provided the following report wishes to remain anonymous. He had read in Ray Crow's track record newsletter about the cargo nets and helicopters used to transport dead bodies of Bigfoot after the Mount St. Helens eruption on May 18, 1980. He wanted to add his information in support of this account. At the time, he was far east in Spokane, Washington, visiting an aunt who lived in the Burbs near Fairchild Strategic Command Air Force Base. About 11 a.m., he says that a dark double-rotor green helicopter with a big star went overhead about 100 to 150 feet and he said he could see hairy arms and legs hanging out of the cargo net. 
The chopper was headed westbound, back toward Mount St. Helens. He said he could see at least three creatures, along with tree debris and other garbage, apparently used to disguise the load. The creatures were still covered with gray ash. I got a real good look at them, he said. He immediately got on the phone and called several federal numbers, including the FBI, to get some information on what he had seen. Several days later, he had a return call from a deep voice caller, unidentified, except that he said he worked for the government. He told the witness, due to national security, if you ever tell anybody what you saw, unpleasant circumstances could develop. You might disappear, and nobody would ever know what happened to you. He summed it up and ended the call with, I'll erase your ass, and there were no Bigfoot or Sasquatch parts in there. More Bodies on Mount St. Helens, 1980 Speaking of Bigfoot bodies, credible rumor has it that the Army Corps of Engineers had taken out two bodies from Mount St. Helens two months after the blast. There was a dredging operation of the Cowlitz River, and two Bigfoot bodies were found in the sand. A chopper came in and flew them off. The crane that was doing the dredging was from the Nanatawaka Company. They liked to watch, 1980s. A woman named Mildred was involved in building a cabin 25 years ago near Moses Lake, Washington, Grant County. She said that five or six Bigfoot creatures gathered on a hill opposite them and watched them working for hours, leaving her to believe that the creatures were peaceful. Ranger Battalion Spots Bigfoot, 1984 An ex-military soldier, Ben, said that in February 1984, he was airlifted by a Black Hawk helicopter in a five-man team to a site four and a half kilometers south of Cat Lake, east of Sequim, Washington. The Ranger Battalion team was required to do a ground forest patrol. It was really cold, somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m., they proceeded in what Ben called a lazy W formation. As they moved forward, something made a weird primal scream, almost like a horse neigh. Apparently hearing the men, whatever it was that made the scream, left rapidly. It was an old-growth forest, very dark, although the men's eyes had become attuned to the darkness. They had Antis 5 night vision goggles, and two soldiers at the extreme ends of the W had PBS 2-4 sniper rifles. They saw the creature run off on two legs. It was 7 to 8 feet tall and a good 5 to 600 pounds. Skunk Cabbage Snack, 1985 In October 1985, near Cumberland, Washington, King County, on the road to Palmer, two hunters trying to spot grouse ran into a strong smell, like that of a wet elk coming from a swamp. Seeing something big move only a hundred feet away and finally stand up from a squatting position, they realized it was a Bigfoot. They rejected the idea of shooting the creature, opting instead to fire a gun to scare it away. It was eating skunk cabbage leaves and roots. It was very wary of us and kept rocking back and forth nervously. The creature would duck down every now and then, apparently to hide, there was no noise except grunting like a big ape and a squeal when it took off as the gun was discharged. Estimated at 8 to 9 feet tall and 400 pounds, it had grayish colored hair, 12 inches long all over its body. It had a blackish colored flat face with lots of hair, large lips, rounded head and blackish skin visible on its face and hands. The eyes showed white corneas with black pupils. It used its arms to propel itself forward grabbing at vine maples to swing behind as it retreated. They noted that the creature had thumb dexterity as it peeled back the leafy material on the skunk cabbage to expose the fleshy root and eat. The upper lip pulled back when it ate, and it had a row of flat teeth in the front. Soldier Hears and Smells Creature, 1985 In late July 1985, at the Fort Lewis military base south of Tacoma, Washington, a soldier was with his platoon being airlifted by chopper for a week's maneuvering, somewhere close to the Nisqually River and Mount Rainier. He was assigned to a foxhole listening post in the forward area. It was around 2 a.m. when he heard heavy footfalls to his front to the right, heading away to the left. He then sensed a rotten cabbage or hot garbage odor, very putrid, making his eyes water. 
45 minutes later, there was a scream from a couple of miles away that he couldn't describe, sounding painful or even a bit lonely. The next morning, the smell still lingered in the air. Peekaboo Bigfoot, 1986 Harold Morris and wife, non-believers in Bigfoot, were collecting rocks at Opal Butte in a county park campground near Hepner, Oregon, Morrow County. They had parked their car and trailer at the campground. Upon hearing strange noises near their car, they looked over to see a creature hiding behind the front of the car. It would stick its brown pointy head up and look at them, then hide over and over again, like peekaboo. Finally, when tired of the game, it ran quickly up a bank and out of sight. Harold's wife would not let him shoot it with his thirty out six. Berry Picking Bigfoot, 1987 K.S. and four friends drove from Portland, Oregon, to the south side of Mount Hood to camp and hike a trail around the mountain. They found a nice spot at Sherwood Camp near a creek and surrounded by a good crop of huckleberry bushes. They set up their tents, all close together. At 5.30 a.m., K.S. arose, the other still asleep, and noticed movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreen trees. To her shock and surprise, there was a large, thick-set, seven-foot-tall, light beige-colored female creature, entirely covered in hair with its back to K.S. It was trying to reach something, a branch perhaps, that was about 15 feet high. About 10 feet away was another, smaller, hair-covered creature, no hair on the front of its hands, bottom of its feet, or around the eyes, and slightly darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both creatures was about four inches long. The smaller creature was only about three feet tall and was bent over picking up a stick, which it was trying to put in its mouth. The mother gave a kind of grunt at the little one, apparently to tell it to leave the stick alone, and it dropped the stick. K.S. moved slightly and stepped on a twig, thus making a snap sound. The mother creature turned to look right at her. She grunted again at the little one, reached down and took the young one's hand, motioning for him to come with her. She looked in the direction of K.S. again, grunted softly, and they were gone behind the trees. Albino Bigfoot, 1988 In the summer of 1988, in Grays Harbor County, at Little North River, southwest of Aberdeen, Washington, a 12-year-old boy was fishing for crayfish on a small creek. He had arrived here on his motorcycle. Feeling like he was being watched, he looked up to see a white Bigfoot standing 20 feet away on the opposite bank. The Bigfoot had a pot belly, bloodshot blue eyes, a pink complexion, a wide, flat pink nose, and buck teeth. The hair was mostly white, possibly an albino, very white from the chin down to the chest and belly, grayer on the head, shoulders, arms, and back, and gray from the knees down. The creature was estimated to be over six feet tall. The boy threw the crayfish in the air and scrambled to his motorcycle. At the same time, the creature departed down the creek bed. It had a pronounced limp. The boy returned later with his father, and they found huge footprints. The right footprints indicated that the creature was crippled. Family Attacked, 1989 A border patrolman and his family, wife and young girl, were camping near the Canadian border in Whatcom County, exact location not given, when they were attacked by one or more possible Bigfoot. Both the patrolman and his wife were killed. One body was found wrapped around a tree, and another lay atop a large boulder. The campground was torn up, and the tent literally ripped to pieces. The little girl, three or four years old, was unharmed. She was found sitting at a picnic table. Sixteen-inch footprints were found all over the campsite. The Whatcom County Sheriff's Department was at a loss as to what to do with the case, so they called in the FBI which, after investigating, kept all information confidential, sealed, and hushed. A game warden from the game department revealed that hired predator hunters are instructed to kill every Bigfoot they see and to report a killing to the department. The game department would then deny queries because as far as Bigfoot is concerned, it doesn't exist and has never been classified, so there's no such thing. When interviewed, the game warden said they had taken many photographs of tracks in the area, and when asked if the photos taken could be from a grizzly bear, he replied that these were certainly not grizzly tracks. Rock-throwing Bigfoot, 1989 
In March of 1989, Rick Jank was camping at Thunder Lake Campground with another family in the North Cascades National Park, Washington. Two boys from the other family were fishing on Colonial Creek near Diablo Dam. Suddenly, the boys returned very upset, enough that they left all their fishing equipment behind. They said they had seen a Bigfoot across the stream and it was throwing rocks at them. Their dad and Rick went to investigate. Indeed, there was a Bigfoot that started throwing large rocks towards the two men from 35 to 40 feet away. The rocks were large, 16 to 18 inches across. Rick and the family broke camp and left. Rick described the creature as over 7 feet tall, narrow-waisted, dark reddish-brown 3-inch hair, a high brow, and looked more like a monkey than a human. Rick said that the creature wasn't particularly aggressive, only splashing the rocks in the water as if to scare them away from his territory. Bigfoot in the Water, 1991 In 1991, two Indian boys, aged 12 and 13, were watching their salmon nets from a boat near the second tunnel on the Columbia River in Oregon. Both were sort of half asleep. One of the boys woke up sensing that something was wrong. He looked around and saw a Bigfoot in the water up to his chest looking at him. The boy woke his brother and they both had a good look at the creature, which then reached forward, rocked the boat a little, and then just turned around and walked away. Easter Bigfoot, 1991 It was close to Easter in April of 1991. A family was living out on a ranch near Malala, Oregon, where they raised cattle, chickens, turkeys, and pigs. Coming home one night, the headlights of their car picked up a rare, possible albino Bigfoot as they turned into the long driveway. He squatted down behind some bushes trying to hide, but they had already seen him. It was seven feet tall with eight to nine inch light cream colored hair. The mother commented, looks like the Easter Bunny's back again. This was the third year in a row that they had seen the white Bigfoot, always around Easter time, and he would hang around for four or five nights in a row, judging from the dog howling. Dead Baby Bigfoot, 1992. In Molala, Oregon, near Estacada, a hunter had found a dead baby Bigfoot, a furry little brown female that was left ten feet up in the boughs of a tree. It was then covered with other boughs, perhaps an Indian-style burial. The hunter's attention was called to the tree by the piles of huge droppings lying around the base. One can almost visualize a grieving female Bigfoot staying near the remains of her dead young. The hunter contacted the Portland State University, thinking they would be very interested in a new species of animal. He, of course, got the old horse laugh. They wouldn't even look. So the baby creature went into the hunter's deep freezer. The college later called back and asked to see the corpse, but the harm had been done, and he told them where to go. The hunter ultimately disappeared along with the corpse. Family of Bigfoot, 1992 A Warm Springs Indian told of a Bigfoot story related to him by his Yakima Indian grandfather. It seems every fall, a family of six Bigfoot passed near his place on Rattlesnake Creek in Klickitat County, Washington. They were heading west from a hilly forested area east of him. He knew it was the same family because one of the female creatures had tan eyebrows that stood out. In about 1992, a man by the name of Garrett went to the same area to see if he could see the creatures and was rewarded by seeing one at 2 o'clock in the morning when barking dogs awoke him. They could be heard barking from far away but became silent as the creature approached. He saw the creature in silhouette standing behind an outhouse before it faded into the darkness. It was very quiet, but a stinking stench was obvious. Bigfoot Funeral, 1992 The eyewitness of this story wishes to remain completely and securely anonymous, and so shall be called John. John, a man well-educated and a teacher of philosophy, had an extremely rare and strange sighting in the summer of 1992, east of Estacada, Oregon. He had gone on a long hike by himself, finding it very peaceful, enjoyable, and uneventful. About four or five hours into the hike, the silence of the forest was interrupted by the sounds of clink, clink, clink. Curiously and quietly approaching the upstream noise, John was shocked to find himself less than a hundred yards away from two Bigfoot creatures, Startled, but very intrigued, 
He hid behind some bushes to watch. One was larger than the other, but he couldn't tell if they were male and female, only that they were tall, huge, and covered in dark hair. As he continued to watch in awe, he could see that they were piling good-sized rocks on top of something, thus accounting for the clinking sounds. Taking a closer look, he realized what they were piling the rocks upon. The Bigfoot were engaged in burying another dead Bigfoot under a pile of stones. They had not dug a hole, but were simply covering the body with stones. Suddenly, two smaller, red-colored Bigfoot appeared, each helping to place a stone. John said that the Bigfoot were acting very sad, and for some reason, he himself experienced intense feelings of sorrow as well. He watched them for as long as he could before quietly slipping away. Hotfoot, 1992 In the summer of 1992, David was fighting fires with the Job Corps on the Yakima Indian Reservation in Washington State. During a fire, he witnessed a Bigfoot that came running out of the burning area, running right through the hot coals and towards several Indians on the fire line. Three of them dropped their equipment and left the area, refusing to go back. Aging Sasquatch, 1993 Dan B. and a party of eight were fishing for steelhead in the spring of 1993 on the Clallam River about two to three miles from the Strait of Juan de Fuca, west of Port Angeles, Washington. After dark, as they were eating dinner, they heard movement in the brush, then a crunching on the gravel road. Dan turned the pickup headlights on, and there was an old, gray-haired Bigfoot in the beams, mouth open in surprise. The teeth were broken and decaying, and it had a beard. The chest hair was ragged-looking, black, though mostly gray. In a panic, it ran through a vine maple stand, breaking limbs, and cut a swath across the field, screaming as it ran. Human-like tracks were later found that measured 16 inches long. Goat found dead, Bigfoot suspected, 1994. February 1994, Welches, Oregon, Clackamas County. A farmer reported that a 25 to 30 foot section of his barbed wire fence was down and he was missing a goat. The goat was later found dead, its neck broken, bowels missing, and tongue gone. The next day, the body had been moved and was hanging over the low limb of a tree. On the ground surrounding the tree were 16 inch, five toed tracks. A researcher showed up to investigate and made several plaster casts of the prints. This account makes one wonder about animal mutilations with speculated UFO connections. Is it possible Bigfoot might be responsible for some of them? Monthly Visitor, 1994 In 1994, west of Highway 101 on Bunker Road, Grays Harbor, Washington, a resident reported that a Bigfoot came around once a month. Large tracks were found, though the creature was never seen. It went to a burn barrel where the resident noted meat wrappers were thrown around and the potato peelings would be missing. The resident began leaving whole potatoes and cucumbers out and soon found out that cucumbers were its favorite. He put up a night light, but the creature would only come around when it was off. Winucci Lake Wrestlers, 1994 most interesting is an incident that took place in the spring of 1994 at Winucci Lake in Washington State. For a good 30 minutes, a group of campers from different parties watched intently through a spotting scope as two Bigfoot wrestled with each other on one of the nearby mountainsides. Yakima Protect Bigfoot, 1995 a Yakima Native American and traditional storyteller told of a friend driving from Portland to Warm Springs, Oregon and stopping to rest. A Bigfoot stepped out of the woods, came up to his car and began to shake it. It then turned away and walked back into the woods. Around the same time on the Yakima Reservation, a Bigfoot came down from the mountains and looked into trailers and houses. The Yakima Indians don't tell anyone their stories, as they're afraid Bigfoot will be shot. Bigfoot in the Mine Shaft, 1996. A man and his wife were exploring an old mine shaft near the upper Clackamas River in January 1996. There are about 30 abandoned quicksilver mines in the vicinity, south side of the river. The mine being explored by the couple is near Lake Harriet, off Highway 57, east of the Ripple Brook Ranger Station. 
The horizontal shaft was boarded up with a special door for entry that one had to crawl through. Using big flashlights, they entered the mine, the lady first. A short distance from the entrance of the 400-foot shaft, she saw a Bigfoot. She was so startled that she dashed back out with her husband, who did not see it, following. She then told him of the shaggy, silver-gray creature she had seen. The creature was sitting hunkered up, head between its knees, and its arms wrapped around itself, with one human-like hand shading its eyes from the flashlight. She described it in human terms, and said she commented on the foul odor when they entered the shaft. Later, her husband returned with some neighbors. They re-entered the shaft and explored it to its end without seeing the creature. They did, however, find a bed that was comprised of sticks, moss, and ferns. Sasquatch Rescues Man, 1996 Hav Tran was hiking in the Deschutes National Forest, Oregon, on July 13, 1996. He had been hiking up a steep slope when he slipped and fell, breaking his leg, a compound fracture with the bone sticking out. He passed out, and when he regained consciousness, there were two Bigfoot hovering over him. The larger one was seven to eight feet tall, a gray-white color. The eyes were black, it had a large, sloping forehead with a dome-shaped head, ending in a peak, and it had very big feet. The second creature was the same height, but it was a sandy gray color. It had a white ruff on top of its head. They were very hairy, and he couldn't tell the sex of either. They were jabbering at each other, not using words, but indistinct noises. He passed out again and did not reawaken until his wife shook him. She told him two ape men had carried him out of the forest and deposited him near her. She said they were horribly ugly and added that they had very long hair except on the face, hands, heads, and feet. She took him to the hospital for medical attention. Close-up sighting, 1996. Kurt Armbruster from Scotland was visiting friends in Curlew, Washington, near the Canadian border. On March 16, 1996, he took a hike up nearby Mount Vulcan, and close to the top, he found himself 75 yards away from what he thought was a bear digging in a 10-foot snowbank. It was 9.30 a.m., and the sun was shining on the animal, so being a nature lover, he wanted a closer look. At 25 yards, the creature stood up, a full 9 feet tall, and turned to face him, a large digging stick in its hand. They stared at each other for a few seconds, and then it walked off into a thicket and was gone. Not believing what he had just seen, and thankful he was still alive, Kurt walked over to where the creature had been, and noted that it had been digging up a bush that had red berries on it, and there was a small stack of the berries on the ground. Kurt emphasized that the creature was a male. It had a very long penis and testicles, like a small horse, he said. The creature had reached its left hand up to its head and was missing an index finger. The hair all over its body was a short brown-black color, matted at the shoulders and thighs, and softer in the chest area. It had no facial hair or hair on the palms or the soles of its feet. He measured the tracks it left using his forearm. They were 21 inches long and about 7 inches at the ball. Its stride was about 7 to 8 feet. It curiously slipped into the brush without breaking any branches or making any noise. There was an awful stench. When it first turned and saw him, Kurt said, it looked surprised, and its almond-shaped eyes widened. He noted that the eyes appeared blue, with the eyeball white. It grunted at him, and he saw the teeth were bright white and like human teeth. The arms seemed to hang proportionately, longer than humans. It did not have a neck. The naked skin of the face was like a Caucasian, and the head came to a rounded point. It had a large, human-like nose and heavy eyebrows. The mouth seemed ridiculously small. Bigfoot on the Beach, 1997 On October 11, 1997, a woman from a search and rescue group was hiking near Claylock on the Washington coast. She was on a 28-mile wilderness trail when she stopped and dropped away from her group to take a nature break. As she peered out of the forest at the ocean, she noticed about 200 yards away a tall, brown, hairy Bigfoot sitting on a log looking out to sea and casually dragging its hand through the sand, leaning down to do it. After several minutes of watching, the creature suddenly stiffened, looked her way, and made eye contact. 
bent over, and with giant strides, it bounded off into the forest, making a lot of noise crashing through the woods. She didn't follow or look for tracks, but hurried to catch up with her group to tell them what she saw. They didn't believe her. Prospector Spots Bigfoot, 1997 In 1997, an older fellow was panning for gold several miles up Angles Creek in Chelan County, Washington. The valley where the creek runs is called Nightmare Valley. As he was focusing on his task at hand, he felt what he described as a presence. Something was watching him. As he looked up, about 20 feet away and across the creek stood a tall, hairy-looking hominid male. The creature did not startle him, just more or less amazed him. The two of them made eye contact for what seemed to him to be about 30 seconds, and then the creature appeared to lose interest and just turned around and disappeared into the brush. He described the creature as having a flat face, long arms, small waist, and a large chest. The fellow decided he had done enough for that day, so he packed up camp and left before nightfall. Spotted from the Air, 1999 T.S. is a skydiver, and in August, he was in Kapowson, Washington, at the annual skydive boogie. When he and his friends were en route to the drop zone in their Cessna, they looked down and saw a Sasquatch walking along a road. The pilot whipped the plane around and buzzed the creature at about a 100 feet. It took off running down the road with huge strides. It later leapt off the road and ran up a hill, jumping stumps as if they were nothing. They came back for another look, but it was gone. Bigfoot hit and killed, 2000. In 2000, a fellow who worked for the county roads department told of a Bigfoot being hit and killed by a car near Yale, Washington in Cowlitz County. He had to assist at the scene by blocking the road while a Forest Service chopper picked up the body. Mysterious Rock Pile, 2001 I have a co-worker who went camping with some friends near Mount Hood in Oregon. They hiked a number of miles off the main roads and came to an area with six piles of rocks in various locations throughout the area. They set up their camp in this area and later knocked over the rock piles, thinking they were victims of a prank by some past campers who used the same site. The following morning, they awoke to find all six rock piles had been restored, and a seventh rock pile was now present, next to their burnt-out campfire. The ground was hard, and although they found impressions in the earth, they could not make out any definite tracks. Note by Ray Crow There's a report of a man in Klamath County, Oregon, who was making a road. He came to a large ring of boulders, which he shoved aside with his cat. The next day, they were back in position. This happened several times before he gave in and built the road around the replaced boulders. Shotgun Sally, 2005 Anonymous Report Sightings continue to occur out near Vernonia, Oregon. There is a woman known as Shotgun Sally who lives in a trailer camp near a fishing pond off the Vernonia Highway near town. She regularly has contact with these creatures, as do the locals in her community. They apparently stink and make particular noises. Shotgun Sally has a tendency to shoot her gun off at night to scare these creatures away from her isolated home. They don't hurt anyone, according to one of the locals who owns the fishing hole. Notable Quotes, Sean Fry's 2007 Scariest Moment My scariest experience, hands down, last summer, 2006, in Six Rivers National Forest at Onion Lake. I was walking around the lake checking the shoreline for tracks. The whole lake is about 75 yards across. I was on the opposite side of the lake from my truck, unarmed and looking down at the mud, when I got that very strong feeling that someone was standing behind me. All the hair on my arms and back of my neck stood up on end, and every part of me was saying, do not look behind you, just walk away. And that's exactly what I did. When I got back to my truck, I then looked back, and it whatever had been behind me, was gone. Bigfoot has a sense of humor. We have an area of active study where we know there is a lot of Bigfoot activity. We set up a bait pile in the middle of a big muddy marsh on this old logging road. Nearby there was a pine tree, and we figured it would be a great spot to install a camera trap. We set up the whole thing, put out the apples, set up the camera, 
left and came back a week later. Walking up to the spot, we were very excited as all the apples were gone, but there were no footprints in the mud. We looked over to the camera, and it was turned completely around, pointing away from the bait pile, with not one picture taken. These things are really smart, and I believe very playful as well. Tree Knocking On June 9, 2007, my fiancé and I went to the Six Rivers National Forest, California. We were going out there later to camp for a few weeks, and we went up early to put out some camera traps. When we got to Onion Lake, I found two 13 and a half inch tracks along the shoreline. As I was casting the tracks, some tree knocking sounds began on the slope to the north of us and very close. I started tree knocking back and whatever was knocking would match the number of knocks I made. When I knocked four times, I got four return knocks. Five times, I got five back. Then I made two knocks and this time the return knocks came from the southwest, so there was at least two of them. I tried scanning the trees with my binoculars, and they stopped knocking. My fiancé, Candy, started walking up the hill to where the first knocks came from when there was a loud limb snap, and she heard something moving away from her in the brush. We left to go set the camera traps, and then went back to the shoreline in about an hour to retrieve the casts. During this time, the tree knocking began again. If you are out in the woods and come upon a Bigfoot, do not be afraid. Look the creature directly in the eye, and like a spark of lightning, a jolt of energy will jump between you and the beast, and you will acquire all the secrets of nature. Carrick Indian Tribe of Northern California Thanks for listening. Be sure to watch the three-hour December prize giveaway video. Same as before, watch the video and comment the secret word and your favorite story. Happy Holidays! and good luck.